Now, for our first topic, on July 25th, the U.S. House of Representatives passed H.R. 1176, or the Taiwan International Solidarity Act. The bill is currently in review with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In summary, this bill would require the U.S. State Department to annually report to Congress any efforts on behalf of the PRC to undermine Taiwan's participation in international organizations or in their relations with other countries generally. The bill's preamble states an intention to provide that the United States should oppose any attempts by the PRC to resolve Taiwan's status by distorting the decisions, language, policies, or procedures of international organizations. Miles, how significant is this? Do you think this legislation will have a meaningful effect on Taiwan's position in the international stage? I think this is the first uh, uh, step to address a tremendous uh, injustice and humiliation in the history of American foreign relations. That is uh, the 1971 uh, United Nations Resolution uh, 2758. In that resolution, of course, China's uh, representation and a security uh, uh, council seat was restored. Uh, but uh, on Taiwan also was expelled from the United Nations. That was done in a very, very uh, humiliating fashion, and which I will explain a little bit. Now, for the U.S. Congress to pass a resolution like this is actually quite uh, amazing because it would have been impossible and unimaginable only uh, five, six years ago uh, when you, uh, U.S. Congress touched upon the sovereignty of Taiwan or Taiwan's uh, international status. China would have reacted very uh, uh, viciously uh, against this. So right now, I mean, passed, and uh, you know, um, there's uh, barely any response from China. It shows that uh, the context in which the Taiwan issue is being discussed globally has changed dramatically. Five, six years ago, is only about uh, the sovereignty. It's about uh, whether Taiwan is part of China or not. Nowadays, the global dialogue on Taiwan has changed 180 degrees. Uh, in other words, people approach the issue of Taiwan almost overwhelmingly from the point of view of tyranny versus freedom. And you have many European countries, you have a, a, a U.S. government and, uh, um, and another Asian country talk about the uh, Taiwan status uh, uh, as a freedom and democracy, particularly in light of, of Russia's uh, uh, war in Ukraine. And this is a particularly pungent. So, most countries, when they talk about Taiwan uh, nowadays, related uh, related Taiwan issue to the um, sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. So this is a, a, all by itself is pretty amazing uh, uh, deed uh, that uh, took place in the U.S. Congress. So we've seen this pass through the House. We still need to go through the Senate and not get vetoed by President Biden. Do you see this as a slam dunk, or do you anticipate any pushback or changes made to this legislation as it goes forward? It's hard to say at this moment, because uh, historical background uh, on this issue has been very, very telling. Initially, uh, the Nixon administration in 1971, which at the time was literally begging China for help the United States get out of Vietnam. So Henry Kissinger was dispatched to China. So the discussion at the United Nations on PRC representation in the UN uh, took place right after Kissinger's first secret visit to China. Um, and then uh, during his second visit to China, uh, this was when the uh, UN uh, resolution was discussed and voted on. The Nixon administration's initial intent was to restore the representation of PRC at the UN, gave this permanent seat at the US Security Council to the PRC, but maintain Taiwan as the member of the United Nations. That was the original intent. And it was uh, very interesting because the task of fulfilling this presidential intent was given to George H.W. Bush, who was then America's ambassador to the United Nations. And he did a very poor job, and he s failed to rally our, our essential friends and allies to uh, prevent Chinese demand of getting China in the UN, but in the meantime, expelling Taiwan from the United Nations. Ultimately, I think the issue boils down to one procedural issue, that is uh, to get China back to UN, that's not a major problem. The U.S. actually supported that. But to keep Taiwan in the UN would require a two-thirds majority votes. 
And China said, no, 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 all you need is, uh, the Chinese side was uh, basically saying, no, 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 you need a simple majority, 50%, 51%, that's it. This resolution was brought up by China's uh, ally, Albania, was debated. So the two-thirds requirement would have been okay to keep Taiwan in there, but we were stopped at the back by the British and the Soviets. So the UK and the Soviet Union said, no, 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 you don't, you don't need two-thirds. You need a simple majority. And the U.S. lost that, that, uh, on that uh, particular procedural uh, condition. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very humiliating. It's the beginning of this uh, uh, tremendously dangerous ambiguity on Taiwan's status. Uh, since then, the United States carry out what uh, we now call the One China Policy versus the Chinese government's One China Principle. The difference is this. The Chinese side said, you know, One China Principle clearly uh, would uh, uh, say that Taiwan is a part of the People's Republic of China. The United States, no. One China Policy from Washington, D.C. simply means that we are aware there is such an argument that Taiwan should belong to the PRC. We're not endorsing it. Second part of that one China policy is that the United States opposes use of force unilaterally to change the status quo. And the third, I think, is the most important part of, uh, of the U.S. China, one China policy is that all settlement on Taiwan's future must be agreed to by the people of Taiwan. And that's it. Hopefully, that uh, when the Senate overwhelmingly passed this bill, which I think it probably will, will, will happen, and it will send it to the desk of uh, President Biden, and he will sign it. That's my hope. So this is an important step towards uh, away from that ambiguity, as you said. In your opinion, do you think we will see anytime soon outright congressional or presidential support for Taiwan independence? I don't think there is a particular call for for Taiwan independence, the reality is that I mentioned earlier about status quo. The United States supports yeah. status quo. Nobody wants to change the status quo. Then the question is, what is status quo? 85 to 90 percent of people in Taiwan want status quo preserved. Status quo means that no unification with China, no declaration of independence. Which also means that status quo actually is a de facto independence. Because Taiwan, for all practical purposes, is a functioning democracy, is a functioning government, which is its own national identity and its own foreign ministry, defense ministry, its own trade po policy. And uh, uh, Taiwan has never been ruled by uh, the People's Republic of China for, for not even one second um, uh, since 1949. So the question for the U.S., Congress and for, for the U.S. administration is how do we then interpret the status quo? Is status quo independence? Uh, Taiwanese leaders from President Tsai Ing-wen on down has said repeatedly there is no need for Taiwan to declare independence because Taiwan is already an independent state and its name is Republic of China in Taiwan. The Chinese government has always used the issue of Taiwanese independence as a red herring, declaring that there is a a tremendous force, a powerful clique in Taiwan seeking new declaration of independence. That's just nonsense. doesn't exist. For our next topic, here's something I imagine a lot of our domestic U.S. audience may have missed. A runaway musical sensation in China being called the... I'm going to go for this. Uh, Luo Cha Hai Shi, yeah. Luo Cha Hai Shi? Yeah, the Luo Cha Hai Shi, yeah. The song is billed as a combination of Chinese folk songs and stories from a Qing Dynasty classic, but commentators have noted that it seems to be a satirical takedown of the Chinese entertainment industry and society uh, through coded insults. Miles, could you explain what's going on here um, and why this song is so popular? Well, this is a song by a relatively obscure but popular singer. His name is Dao Lang. Uh, let me spell it out. D-A-O and L-A-N-G. And the song's uh, title is called uh, Luo Cha Hai Shi. It's uh, L-U-O-C-H-A and then H-A-I-S-H-I. -H -I. It's basically, you know, that came out about two weeks ago. And I, I want uh, listeners to, to, to pay attention to what I'm going to say next. Since it's rolled out two weeks ago, it has been played over 9 billion times. 9 billion times in China. 
primarily on on Douyin, which is the Chinese domestic version of TikTok. It's owned by the same company, uh, Dibans. By all accounts, it's a smashing cultural phenomenon that's sweeping China. A surrealistic short story told by China's foremost satirist, a surrealistic ghost story writer, uh, Pu Songlin. This short story is part of a masterpiece, Liao Zai Zhi Yi, which is roughly translated into something like Strange Tales from a Storytelling Chamber. This book was published in 1740, uh, nearly 300 years ago. In this story, uh, uh, Pu Songlin described a handsome young merchant man, uh, his name is Ma Ji, who uh, on one of his commercial trips, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, ship was blown off course by a, a storm, and he stumbled upon an absurd and ridiculous kingdom called the Luo Cha. Uh, where everything is upside down. Ugliness is beauty, vice is virtue, prostitutes and pimps were paragons of social mores. The ugliest person on the island with three nostrils whose ears were grown backwards is the prime minister. The donkey in the Luocha kingdom fancy itself as a stud, a mastan, or a stallion. The flightless chicken dream of self of being a soaring bird of power and virility. Everyone in this kingdom is a pretender, a cheater, and a phony. So this song by Dao Lang that, that's wrote two weeks ago, uh, use all the characters in this story uh, of 1740 from the beginning uh, of the song and explicitly uh, suggest that this kingdom is in fact today's China. That's where the power <laughs> comes in, and its popularity uh, just began to uh, to increase dramatically. And because this uh, song uh, uh, writer, the singer uh, Dao Lang himself, has been vilified by virtually all the big shots in China's official music establishment. So all the characters in the lyrics can be easily related to each of the individual celebrities uh, uh, who are endorsed by the Communist Party, who have bullied him and humiliated the uh, singer Dao Lang. This is why people uh, 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 feel uh, these lyrics were in incredibly uh, suggestive and powerful. Not only that, in this uh, uh, sort of very surreal surrealistic song, Dao Lang uh, uh, ends this, uh, uh, his song with a serious sentence. The last sentence of the lyrics uh, says, This is surreal and ugly state of affairs in the kingdom of Luo Cha, meaning China, is the fundamental problem of mankind. <laughs> so, with one single song, the Dao Lang has become China's Bobby Dylan. Wow. A voice of oblique protest and a powerful expression of a volcanic anti establishmentarian mentality. To a certain degree, if I may, uh, the popularity of this song has also, uh, has also has something to do with this uh, uh, artistic uh, 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 quality. Artistically, it's very clever. He uses all the uh, historical allegories, metaphors, and never clearly spells out its specifics, yet everybody understands what and whom uh, uh, this song is aimed at, that is, the snobbish cultural establishment of the PRC. It contains a lot of puzzles, riddles, as well as the uh, mentioned names like, you know, the Australian philosopher Wittgenstein, for example. Wittgenstein, of course, you know, um, was famous for a study of logic and the manipulation of perception and mind. Uh, and he also used a lot of a very elegant and testful rendition of the unmentionables. And uh, this song is a hodgepodge and mystic lyrics. Uh, reminds me of uh, Don McLean's American Pie. There's a lot of very, uh, very obscure uh, references over there, giving it the power of suggestion and imagination. He you know, has this uh, 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 incredible power of cousin without using a single dirty word, and, uh, which reminds me of the, uh, the master in this category of, of Voltaire of uh, uh, 17th, 18th century in France. Of course, the difference is that Voltaire never had close to 9 billion plays of his work. I think uh, Dao Lang's sensational new song, Luo Cha Hai Si, is nothing but a giant middle finger to the PRC cultural establishment that is full of snobbery, ostentatiousness, fakery, and distorted and tortured aesthetics.
Miles, this is just incredible. I mean, I guess the, the question I have is, this song's been out for two weeks now. The meaning of the song is cryptic, but people are picking up on it, spreading like wildfire. The Chinese Communist Party is not blind to the power of images and poetry and the effect that that can have on a people and how that can affect the position of a ruler or the uh, state of a political community. What do you think the response is going to be? Does the singer need to be worried? Is he in China right now? Um, should he be concerned? It's very hard to pin anything on him, the singer himself, because he never used any direct reference to the party, to the uh, uh, to any particular individual. Living in China had this kind of unbearable lightness, lightness of being. <laughs> this is to use a, a popular expression. And people are very subdued overall, uh, particularly this, this time of day of Xi Jinping's regime. But this song basically you know, um, lightened people up. Uh, they got uh, really, really excited about uh, uh, how to sort of uh, uh, vent their displeasure and disenchantment. Uh, you can see there's a lot of copycats, a lot of funny renditions uh, of the same song and uh, in different kind of a form of arts. Picking opera, you know, uh, uh, different kind of regional opera uh, schemes. And uh, there are hundreds and hundreds each day coming out. As I say, China is a, a country of the tyranny and dictatorship, but also China is a country of extremely surreal reality. It's very, very absurd. So that's why people began to realize uh, not only China is a bad country, but also is an absurd country, is a very Kafka esque. Certainly. Well, for our last topic, looking to the government and the way it acts uh, in particular. Northern China is in the midst of devastating flooding right now with Beijing receiving the heaviest rainfall it's seen in 140 years as a result of Typhoon Duxuri. Millions of people have been evacuated and relocated. There's been a significant amount of popular resentment, though, towards the government's response. Uh, Miles, from what I've seen, it appears that in an effort to protect Beijing, floodwaters were intentionally diverted to neighboring areas, which unnecessarily increased the destruction to population centers outside of the capital. Is this correct? Could you shed some light on what's happening here and why people are so upset? And... Um, I guess just as a follow-up, is the government's response as reprehensible as people are claiming? Well, this is uh, the typhoon Daxuri, as I said, it has dumped a lot of water in northern China, particularly in the area near Beijing, which is the capital. So, in order to uh, to protect Beijing, the Chinese government uh, has decided to sort of discharge a lot of water from the the dams, several couple dozen dams surrounding Beijing, and di divert the flood water to somewhere else. This has never been openly announced, but it did happen. And uh, that makes a lot of people uh, who were affected by the diverted water very, very upset. Uh, not only it was not clearly announced, there was no sufficient prior warning of the, uh, of the discharge of the uh, dam water uh, to the air, uh, to residents in the area to be affected. So that's why people are very, very upset. Another source of resentment actually comes to uh, a, a, a traditional Chinese communist uh, methods, that is the cover-up. There are very powerful propaganda on Chinese media, TV, the fake helicopter rescue and the fake tired rescue uh, workers over there. And the, the, the people actually point out that this is totally fake. And that's why people get really, really upset. And there are some villages there where the, the, a dam was supposed to be um, um, open, so the uh, the officials will came in the middle of the night without telling the sleeping villagers, uh, and then once they're discovered, the villagers get so angry they went to the place where the gate uh, it was and to confront the officials. There was a lot of body clashes over there. So that's why you know this is kind of uh, was done without the consent uh, of the people, uh, uh, of course, uh, but also without the warning to the people to be affected. It shows the the callousness of the government. And when this uh, uh, flood of uh, almost biblical proportion took place in, in, in northern China, Xi Jinping was in, uh, in Chengdu uh, to attend the, uh, the World University Games, um, dining, whining. So people really, really uh, get really upset uh, and, uh, about the priority of the, of the Chinese government. Incidentally, this is where Taiwan is playing very smart uh, politics. The president of Taiwan, Chai Ing-wen, and his vi her vice president, uh, uh, William Lai, promptly sent uh, 
uh, words of condolences and encouragement to the people affected in uh, uh, in China, northern China, by the flood and in simplified Chinese uh, characters. And uh, uh, this scored very big among popular, uh, among ordinary Chinese people. <laughs>